Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. We're doing things a bit differently, as uh, you might guess, um, but everything is a bit different than it was not long ago. I read of a young couple who had been out on a 25-day wilderness raft trip, and they were totally out of touch. Upon their return, they found themselves in the throes of our current pandemic and, of course, were quoted to say, the world is going crazy. It's kind of a Rip Van Winkle experience where Rip fell asleep for 20 years out in the forest, and upon awakening, he discovered that he had slept through the American Revolution. Things had really changed. You would have to have been sleeping for weeks be under a rock, awakening and emerging just a few minutes ago to wonder why everything has changed so much in a matter of weeks. These surely have been challenging days for our community and for our nation and our world. In many ways, it has only begun. Say what you will, this whole business is proving itself to be an historic moment. Nothing like it has ever happened in our lifetime, and this history is hard to read as we move into the future. From the standpoint of Bethlehem Church, we have committed ourselves to follow guidelines provided by the government because it's the right thing to do, and, and by doing it, we care for each other, and we protect one another and those of our surrounding community. We want to keep one another safe. We have tried to do some creative thinking about our ministry and tried to imagine how to do ministry in these un unusual circumstances. We can see this as a problem, or we can see this as an opportunity. And of course, we prefer to see it as an opportunity. Your staff has met to th think through some possibilities. And I am reminded how Fred Rogers, who has been memorialized recently with a film and a number of books, how he said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. We want to be the helpers that people want to see. I've contacted the local, local elementary school principal to offer assistance in any way. Local health care facilities have halted visitation so we have begun contacting those folks to assure them of our care for them. Kim Piper has been working at that with great energy. We've been learning about how to post worship and other services online and through our website and Facebook. Sean Garner and Keith Metzel and their team have been working at that. We believe you will see and hear more of that as we move forward. Today is our first effort. We hope to get better at it. And we hope to do some creative thinking about Holy Thursday and Good Friday services using technology. You will hear more of that as Holy Week approaches. As all church activities have been canceled, you need to know that our Easter egg fundraiser has also been canceled. Those with prepaid orders will have their money returned to them. Common Grounds Coffee House is also closed until further notice. We've kept the church open for prayer and encourage you to drop by during the hours of 10 and 4 p.m. on weekdays and on Sunday from 9 to 12. There will be plenty of room to sit very far apart. Some have indicated that prayer in the sanctuary seems helpful to them. Lastly, regarding this service, we are posting words as we are led in worship so that you may participate at home. There are prayers and hymns and songs of praise, so make a joyful noise. Choir anthems have been pulled from services in our recent past, which are appropriate for the season of Lent. We surely do want to welcome you to worship.
As you have prepared for worship, I hope that you uh, took care to print out the bulletin so that uh, you might follow along. Although many of the words are on the screen uh, behind me, uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, there's other information on the bulletin that may be helpful as well. So, uh, I invite you now to join me in the call to prayer. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we who also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, that has been given to us. Let us pray together. Almighty and eternal God, you are a refiner's fire. You are the thunder at the mountain. You are the potter with the clay. You are the pillar of cloud in the wilderness and the burning bush in the desert. We do not take off our shoes as did Moses, but we do take off our pride as we stand in awe and reverence in your holy presence. Amen. And now we join in a time of silent prayer and meditation.
As we prepare to pray, I would like to uh, pray a bit differently than we normally do, and that is I'll suggest the phrase and ask that you spend time meditating on that phrase and making your own prayers as we uh, join our hearts and minds together before Almighty God. Let us pray. Lord, these are days when we are not sure how or what to pray. We have a struggle ahead of us and don't know where to begin. We do pray for those who have been stricken by the coronavirus. Visit them with healing. It is a virus that has made its way around the world. And so we pray for those who are in trouble. We pray for those medical professionals who are hard at work in bringing relief to those who are stricken. We pray for them as they use their wisdom to treat the patients, but also pray that you would protect them from harm. They are vulnerable, and so we ask your presence with them. We pray for our leadership in all phases of government. At all levels, give them the wisdom that they need to lead us through this crisis. Help us as a citizenship to have confidence in those who lead us. We pray for medical professionals and scientists who are looking for solutions and who are doing their best to provide guidance so that we will successfully navigate these difficult days. We pray for manufacturers who find that they must now change their work in order to provide the supplies and the equipment that is necessary, so necessary for the treatment and protection of our citizenship. Help them to meet the demands, we pray. We pray for those who are in deep trouble because of the economics that have unfolded with regard to the coronavirus, for those who find themselves unemployed and are struggling to pay their bills, for those who are looking for ways to help so that people will remain solvent and be able to navigate these difficult waters. And we pray for all others. We pray for family and friends. Help us all to live wisely. Help us to protect ourselves and one another. And help us to care for one another and find ways to care for those in our community who need help. Let us be among those who help, always. And now we would join our voices together as we pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So many things are different in these days, and, and that is true of the ways in which we give. We are asking all of our members and friends to consider giving electronically. We've had a relationship with Vanco for many years. Some of our members already give electronically, and we have had no problems with the system whatsoever. Many, many churches use the services of Vanco. I read a recent article from a respected church consultant. He suggested that by now 60% of congregational giving should be done digitally. Can you imagine? Immediately I knew we were way behind. So please consider making your gift through Vanco. Simply click on the button and follow the prompts. When you think of it, the need for ministry has never been greater in our community than it is right now. I've received many requests for help already, and I'm quite sure it has only begun. My good friend Ed Ziders reminds me that church buildings may be closed, with meetings and events canceled for a few weeks, but the church is not closed. In fact, that's not even possible, for the church is the community of Christian believers, and we are alive and doing what the church always does. Wherever there are Christians, there is the church open, loving, living, caring, praying, and praising God. The church is at its best when generosity is a defining characteristic. We believe generosity is a spiritual experience well before it is a financial decision. During this time, we have an opportunity to show the world how the practice of generosity is one of the most powerful actions we can take to unite, serve, and create an impact in the world. Let us pray. Dear God, we take this moment not to ask you for anything, but to simply say thank you for all that we have. Help us in our abundance to think of those who are struggling and now to give with them and my church family in my heart. In Christ I pray. Amen.
As is our practice here at Bethlehem, I invite you to read the scriptures with me. We are reading from Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as you can see in this scripture lesson, there was really no rest for the weary. Jesus had just gotten off the boat, traveling across the sea, when an official of the synagogue marched right up to him. We even learned the name of the man because he was an important man. His name was Jairus. This man of some prestige begs Jesus to come and lay hands in order to heal his daughter. She was desperately ill, and Jairus has faith in Christ to heal. Jairus was dumbfounded that Jesus had apparently arrived on the boat just in time. My little daughter is dying, he said. Some of you can imagine the pain of a father who needs to say that, because some of you have lived through the pain of that message. All we are told is that Jesus went with him. There would be no cruise ship deck chair for him, no front porch swing after a tiring trip. Jesus went with him. But then the strangest thing happens. A woman sneaked up on Jesus, and this trip to see a dying daughter of an important man was suddenly interrupted by an anonymous woman. Not only was she unimportant, but according to the custom of the day, she was unclean. So this day, she turned into a stalker of Jesus, hoping only to touch the hem of his garment. Her faith was so great, and she was so desperate that she felt that touching the threads of Jesus' cloak would be enough, and so she parked herself along the way. For 12 years, she struggled with her illness, and you could certainly imagine her frustration. She had a bleeding uterus. It would not stop. She probably went from doctor to doctor, from healer to healer, in order to seek relief. You know what it's like to just get a second opinion, but how many opinions do you suppose she tried to get in order to be healed? The only consequence was a lot of money was spent with no result. She couldn't seem to lay her burden down. It left her broke, weak, anemic, pale, and so, so very tired. It would be one thing if it were just the illness, but there was so much more. An issue of blood like hers left her a social outcast. Everyone suspected and imagined, oh, it must have been some sexual sin that left her in such a condition. She is unclean by Jewish law. In our day, this meant that she would not be allowed to come to church. You couldn't sit near her, for if she happened to touch you, you would have to bathe immediately and launder your clothing she was walking pollution and carried the shame along with her horrid social stigma. Oh, we are so much more enlightened, aren't we? We would never shun anyone like that, would we? Ha! If you believe that, you've never been in a middle school or high school lunchroom, or you've never seen an office gossip circle in action. No one was hanging out with her. She no longer dreamed of getting married, of combing the hair of a daughter, or wiping the dirty face of a son, or of bounding grandbabies on her knee, of being loved and taken care of in her old age. No, her suffering has shattered all of her dreams. They have been swept up in little piles to be carried out in a dustpan to the morning trash. That is what this woman brought with her as she crowded her way near the pathway and crouched as Jesus walked toward her. Jesus had come with a reputation. Here was a physician who charged no fee. Here was one who asked for nothing in return. He had success for other incurables. Why not her? A boy with seizures, a man with demonic possession, a quadriplegic, a leper. Yes, Jesus had a reputation. And yet he was on his way to the home of Jairus. His tired frame was being jostled by those who pressed up against him. Shoulders bumped, elbows touched, the eager, the curious, the desperate, an important man named Jairus, and then this desperate, unimportant woman with no name. She pushed her hand through a seam in the crowd and grasped the corner of his robe. And for a fleeting moment, she tugged in faith, and Jesus was immediately brought up short. On our recent trip to the Holy Land at a place called the Encounter Chapel, 
in the Galilean seaside town called Magdala, an artist named Daniel Cariola was commissioned to paint this moment, the moment when the woman reached out, the moment when Jesus stopped. Who touched me? He was pulled back, not by the grasp of her hand on his robe, but by the grasp of her faith. Who touched me? Power had left him to surge into this bleeding woman. Who touched me? She wanted to remain unnoticed and anonymous, but finally his eyes met hers. And he knew. He knew. And she fell at his feet. Through her tears and the windows of her eyes, Jesus could see the whole sad story of the last 12 years. The illness, the loneliness, the isolation, the desperation. Only God could know how much she suffered, face to face, physician and patient. Do you remember what he called her? Daughter. Daughter, your faith has healed you. He won't just allow her to slip away, because in that moment she is more important than anyone else in the world. And Jesus addresses her, Daughter, and new life was given to her. But wait, while Jesus is chatting with this unclean, unsignificant woman, there is a man pacing impatiently. Jairus must have been like a man in a hurry, standing in a long line at the bank, while the other line was moving along quickly. There he stood. Come on, Jesus, stop dawdling. I was here first. You were on your way to my house. And as they were about to restart the journey, the worst news a father can hear arrives. There was no easy way to say it, so the messenger just blurted it out. Your daughter is dead. Sadly, there are some here who have heard that news of a daughter or a son, or you know someone who has. Not every touch heals. The answers are not available to every doctor. The miracle doesn't occur in every situation. Your daughter is dead. And Jairus' faith must have dropped like a load of bricks. Timothy George writes of Martin Luther, at one of the lowest points in Luther's life. His beloved daughter, Magdalena, barely 14 years of age, was stricken with the plague. Luther was brokenhearted as he knelt beside her bed and begged God to release her from her pain. And when she died, and carpenters were nailing down the lid of her coffin, Luther screamed out, Hammer away! On doomsday, she will rise again. Jairus wasn't yet in the same position as Luther, but the news cut like a knife. It was all over. The rabbi was too late. Even if he were on time, she probably was too far gone. But it was as though Jesus was ignoring the messenger. Don't be afraid, he said, only believe. How many times must we hear Jesus tell us not to fear? How often must we read, fear not, in Scripture, before we understand the crippling power that fear can take in our lives? And Jesus walked on to the house with Peter, James, and John. The father must have been wondering, what the heck is going on here? Daughter dead? And I'm asked to put my feelings aside. This is unbelievable. And when they arrived, the morning had already started. The woman had begun to wail, so common to the funerals of the Middle East. The men had begun to rend their clothes. They beat their breasts and tore at their hair. Into that scene, Jesus walked, saying the most outrageous thing. Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. And they laughed at him. These people, after all, had mourned the dead before. Dead is dead. And this girl was definitely dead. And the father must have been even more bewildered. Who is this guy? So Jesus brought it all to a close. He took the mother and father, still holding on by a thread of faith, along with the three disciples who were with him. When they went into the room, he took the girl's hand and uttered the Aramaic words, Talitha kumi. Isn't that a beautiful phrase to say? Little girl, get up. Talitha kumi. 
When you wake up, your little girl tomorrow, pray, Talitha Kumi. And the twelve-year-old rose up and began to walk around the room. Now there are times when I especially wish I had been near to Jesus in a special moment like that in time. This is one of them. How many jaws must have dropped when the little girl walked out of the room into the midst of mourners? My jaw still drops at the wonder of it all. And when Jesus gave strict orders, don't tell anyone about this. And by the way, give the poor child something to eat. She is hungry. One of the things that amazes us about Jesus is that wherever Jesus went, situations seemed to change. Lives were transformed. When Jesus came, fishermen left their nets. Critics trying to trap him left shaking their heads. Storms were stilled. Hungry people were fed. Demons were thrown out, thrown out of their human homes. A chronicle ill woman is healed. A dead girl now raised to life. Wherever Jesus went, things changed, and for the better. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be said? I pray that can be said of the people of this church, of you and of me. Wherever we go, things are made better, transformed for the good. We are carriers of Jesus. What is behind it all? What's the key that accesses the power of Jesus? Today, in the case of the woman with the chronic issue of blood, and in the case of this family with a daughter sick to death, we see that the key to accessing the power of Jesus is faith. Faith. And the faith that is directed toward Jesus unlocks the very power of God. The faith that is directed toward Jesus is given the power to overcome obstacles. For the woman, there were the obstacles of fear and shame which she needed to overcome just to get close to Jesus. For the father, it was the obstacle of the unbelievable that Jesus could overcome the irreversible verdict that the girl was dead, and that Jesus could be trusted in spite of all evidence to the contrary. Finally, that is what faith is. That is all faith is. Trusting God to do what God has promised to do. Faith takes action. Faith takes the next step, the next faithful step. We are drawing ever nearer to the end of the season of Lent. As we arrive at Holy Week, we will again emerge with the greatest statement of faith we can know. God has conquered death in the resurrection, and by faith, we will too. Is there any better hope for these troubled days? Amen and Amen.
I would like to invite you to enjoy an anthem that will serve as our benediction today. It's by one of our own, Joe Rogan, and uh, of course uh, the hymn, the anthem to which I refer is God Will Bless You. Take a deep breath and enjoy as we share together this benediction. <laughs> 